moving to the, the our next uh, speaker in the day. So we have Brian Lanahan. So Brian is the author of the Amazon best <coughs> bestseller, Artificial Intelligence, Foundations for Business Leaders and Consultant. He's an uh, uh, MIT AI program graduate and former bank executive. Consults to diverse organizations on developing and implementing artificial intelligence strategies. Brian will share three case studies to illustrate companies that have been successful at developing a robust inter uh, artificial intelligence strategy and how you can incorporate these strategies in your own business. Brian's humorous approach to business and technology keeps audiences engaged and invigorated about AI and its future potential. So we'd like to invite uh, Brian to the stage. Thank you. So I have to say I respect the people in this group and for two reasons. Number one, you're part of a community that's solving the big problems. And number two, wow, do you take instructions well. <laughs> I saw everybody moving and Matthew, where were you about two books ago? That wrist exercise looked pretty good. So I'm thrilled to be up here today, not as an AI specialist, a coder or programmer, but I work with large companies, with CEOs, with senior leadership teams to talk about things like AI strategy. Last week, I was in Vancouver talking to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Sounds exciting. The next day, it was the Financial Crimes Investigators. And can you imagine what I was talking about? Talking to them about how artificial intelligence can be used in their practice. So what does a traditional fraud audit look like? Well, what they'll do is they'll take a small sample, humans, well, I see some nods, this is good. They'll take a small sample of data, they'll review it for anomalies, maybe 2,000 items, for example, and then they will determine if they can find any anomalies and decide if they should go further. Well, I had to tell them that was a very archaic approach. Let me give you an example. There was a consumer products manufacturing company. They had an inkling that they had some fraud going on in their business. And the total population was about 6 million, 6.2 million transactions. Instead of looking at samples of 2000 at a time, they looked at every single transaction using artificial intelligence in the same amount of time and they identified $2.3 million in fraud. So you can imagine the opportunities for this group of certified fraud examiners and financial crimes investigators, but I said, look, that's really not the AI of the future, is it? Has anybody here heard of Dark Trace? I see some nods, yep. So this is a company that actually installs their software in your company's software so that anomalies can be found as they are happening. So consider the case of internal fraud. As someone is transferring money from a general ledger to another account that they shouldn't be doing it, it's already being identified and alerted to the security team or the head office team. So again, reflect on the fact that these people who are certified fraud examiners and financial crimes investigators are thinking, what? There goes my job, right? So if they can stop the fraud as they're happening, but that's not really the, you know, we all know. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the realities of artificial intelligence and whether that can happen every single time. My job today is to talk about how we can support those big problem solutions like Florian and Era has talked about. How can we increase their probability of success? Whenever I talk to senior leader teams, they will say to me, Brian, we need to implement artificial intelligence. I was talking about it with somebody at the club. I read about it in a newspaper. I saw a great magazine article. So I have to stop them and say, hold on now. What is the business problem that you are trying to solve? 
and then let's see if AI is the solution. So they're about 10 steps back from where you are today in your production. So if you think about the business strategy versus the AI strategy, they're looking for the box at the bottom to fulfill the boxes in the middle. But AI is not necessarily the right tool in every single circumstance. So we have that conversation. So it's important for us to understand, is AI the solution for the business problem we're trying to solve to connect to those KPIs? And I know that's very straightforward. But when you start seeing the excitement level in these decision makers, you really have to pull them back. In the bottom left-hand corner, these are all components that you're very familiar with, but less so in the decision maker's side. What is one of the key challenges that you face every day? It's one of those boxes. Somebody said data. Absolutely. Is it clean data? Is it accurate data? Is it labeled data? And the list goes on. Those aren't even conversations they've had yet about how they're going to implement AI. Do they have the talent within their team to actually go down this path? Do they have the infrastructure? I honestly have talked to some, some companies that still have paper files. How are they going to make that leap? Let alone have a discussion about the appropriate algorithms to use. So what are some of the keys to success? And I'm probably reinforcing for some of you, but this to me is number one. And what do you mean by diversity? It's on multiple different dimensions. Everybody's familiar with the recruiting issue of not having any females being promoted within a certain organization because all the past data said that men got promoted. We need to have women on those teams. And I'm so glad they're well represented here today. What about age? You know, for those people who are over 40, okay, over 50. <laughs> can they contribute? Of course they can. I'm working with a company in Munich, Germany, and they've created a digital coach. And they have a team of excellent, excellent coders. They've created some really interesting, exciting technology so that an individual can work with a digital coach interim to their actual person-to-person -person coaching conversations. It's really going to amp up the capability. But what they didn't have was reliable data. Well, the person who I connected with, who co-wrote my last book, had 40 years worth of performance management coaching data and really didn't know what he was going to do with it. But it had been validated by three different universities over 10 years. All of a sudden, that connection, and by the way, he's 67. He's got a great new lease on life about taking that data and moving it into the AI world. Other types of diversity, backgrounds, specialties. Does anybody here have an arts background? Yes. Why is that relevant? The creative thinking of arts students is incredible. They don't have the limitations of rules-based programming. To have them on that same team asking why or why not is crucial. So number one, diversity. Organizational culture. How many organizations today in Canada are ready to implement AI in all of its wonders? What's the number one concern that employees have about implementing AI? Job loss. As soon as we get them in, there goes my job. Amazon just, just advised they were going to hire 30,000 more people, despite the fact that they're putting a whole bunch of robots 
in their facilities. IBM just came up with a study. The uh, Institute of Business Value said that 120 million workers are going to have to be retrained to use AI. There are so many opportunities, so many new roles for people in organizations, but we need to start training them now to, for those new roles. So from a culture perspective, who is that, whose responsibility is that? The companies, right up to the CEO level. The messaging that they're doing. Every day, day in, day out, we are going to invest in AI, but we also need to invest in our people. That organizational culture is critical. Now, I know when you're a small startup coming up with a solution, it's a very small team. But the, team, but the groups that are going to be using your solutions are going to be impacted as well. You've heard this before, start small and scale. The number one question that I hear from people who are senior leaders is, how do I even get started on this? They have this crazy idea that they're going to, on day one, install this AI across their enterprise. And that's a massive challenge. And what happens to the conversation they have with their board of directors? They say, we want to invest in AI. Number one concern of those board of directors is, what is that going to do to our core revenues? Are you going to lose your focus on our core business? But by starting small on an issue that's really a high priority, it'll be, it'll be much more successful to implement AI. So starting small and scale. So many people I talk to have great ideas. Yet they don't want to face the realities of AI head on. I'm going to go through some of those realities. There was a, um, some data from Fortune, from Wall Street Journal last year. They talked about the percentage of AI projects that fail. Anybody want to give me an idea? <laughs> Someone said 90%. That may be in some markets. 70, 75% of those projects fail. So, so should we stop? Not at all. There are some realities that happen for those projects, and I'll tell you why they fail or what people ignore. In terms of the high failure rate of projects, it's rarely because of the technology. Most often, it's because of the people. Is that surprising? Whether that's pushback, other priorities, lack of belief, concern about jobs, the list goes on and on. So if an AI team is looking at a customer who's looking to implement this, make sure you have your own thoughts around that people issue. Unrealistic expectations of the technology. Has anybody ever seen this? Once we implement AI, everything's going to be better. So setting realistic expectations of those solutions that you have, critical. Whether it's about you know, when it's going to be delivered, what its capabilities are, what it's going to cost us. Is this a challenge that you're seeing? Some of the, some of the statistics suggest that 90% of the data that's ever been created has been, have been created in the last two years, right? That's a pretty common phrase. The second part of that is 90% of that data is unstructured. So if that's truly your going in position, it creates some challenges. Not insurmountable, but creates some challenges. Biased data. So we talked about the gender bias. There are all sorts of different ways that the data can be biased. But again, not an insurmountable issue. What about those regulatory agencies? 
I work a lot in the financial services industry. I've worked with a lot of auditors. If those auditors got the sense that we, and not just the management or director level, but if the C-suite level understood what was going on inside those algorithms, they felt much more comfortable about their position with us. But here's the flip side. Someone mentioned, I think it was Florian mentioned uh, the GDPR in the um, European Union. The National Institute of Science and Technology in the US has just recently issued some uh, draft guidelines. But today's regulation is extremely immature when it comes to artificial intelligence. So when will that maturity gain pace and how will you have to react? Someone mentioned data privacy, absolutely critical. Does anybody hear what happened in Ecuador last week? Yes? 20 million records of 6 million citizens were live on the internet with not even a password. Bank records, social insurance records, where they lived. Within a day, arrests were being made of the company called Novastart and their directors because they allowed this to happen. So you can imagine, you can understand why people are reticent to allow companies to deal with their own data. Responsible AI. Have you had this discussion before, Dragosha, about responsible AI? Ethical, that kind of thing? In Not on this topic exactly, but... Okay. So more and more companies are looking for an understanding of how we're dealing with responsible AI. TD Bank recently led a responsible AI forum. Did anybody attend? Anybody aware of that? So they were, what was one of the topics? Do you remember under responsible AI? Did they talk about ethics, for example? Yeah. So these large organizations, whether it's through the World Economic Forum or their own individual, um, are looking for ways to create ethical solutions because what's at risk? Their brand. And particularly in financial services, your brand is everything. What about this issue, human oversight? There's a lot of belief that artificial intelligence has incredible capabilities. Has anybody seen, um, well maybe you still remember two years ago, Boston Dynamics was showing off their Atlas robot. And what could it do? It could go up a step, right? Just the other day on LinkedIn, they did an updated video. And do you know what it can do now? It, yeah. It can perform like a gymnast in that short period of time, doing somersaults. So you can imagine how people are concerned about the pace at which you and your colleagues are developing artificial intelligence. So they're looking for what is the human oversight? What are the controls that you're going to have in place or are going to enable? Because if your solution says, we don't need any oversight, it's not a sellable. Facial recognition is an incredible capability. Incredible. Obviously in China you've heard that it, it's much more accessible right across the population. But if you live in Oakland or in San Francisco, it's banned. You cannot use facial recognition. And the group that I was talking to, uh, financial crimes investigators, from the RCMP to the police to banks, we're all looking at that going, how could we possibly operate without facial recognition of some kind? When I ran a team and they did facial recognition, you know what it was? They took a picture and went like this to make it bigger. But that was just simply a human looking at it. 
different jurisdictions are going to be dealing with facial recognition very differently. Brussels is another place where they're looking at facial recognition and banning that capability. So what are the implications? Implications like deep fakes. So if you're an organization and your brand is at risk because someone has used an image that is so compelling, but they're saying a message that you don't want that to be said. People have heard of President Obama and you know, various other ones, but deep fakes are becoming even more penetrating because they can now mimic your clothing, they can mimic, it, mimic your movements. It's becoming much more dangerous. Explainability. So if you're looking at an algorithm and you're talking about for convolutional neural networks, you do some training, you do the testing, you fail, you do it over again. By the end, you're an expert at what that thing does. Is everybody else in the organization? No. And if your C-suite aren't experts in that, then that creates a real challenge. Some of the companies that I talk to, based on what they do today, I work with a large payroll company. They have, in the past, recognized themselves as a services company with some technology on the side. You've probably heard this before. I really think they're a technology company with some services on the side. It's becoming that data driven. So if that's the case, then the leaders of that company really need to understand that explainability issue. Here's the one that I really believe in, and I, obviously you do. There were, I was looking at a picture from two years ago of this same group. Dragos, I think you may have had 20 people in the room. I beg your pardon, we had 40. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now there are 350. The collective power of the people in this group to not only share ideas, but make sure that people don't spin their wheels or restart things or you know, start from scratch. I hear it over and over again. I'm thinking of building this. Well, who have you talked to? What ideas have you taken off the shelf? What testing have you already seen done or research that you've you know, found that was compelling? So a community like this is critical for the success of artificial intelligence. Canada is one of the number one countries in the world for AI research, one of the number one company, countries in the world for AI training, but is woefully behind in AI implementation. So this group will make a huge difference. I really believe that the work that the AI Geeks group is doing at 3,500 members and uh, exciting projects is really going to make a difference. Um, it's so compelling that I've included it in my uh, my third book coming up in November because I firmly believe that there's a huge opportunity for Canada and it's sitting in this room. So thank you very much. And no sales pitch. First of all, thank you for this. I come from a background of doing mass surveillance projects. And uh, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I do realize. Sorry, did everybody hear that? Yep. Yes. Okay. So um, I do understand what AI ethics is, 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 impo is important because yeah. none of those solutions was supposed to, it, it, they were supposed to give predictions and there was always have to be a human oversight yeah. on it and people to look into that threats before we, they go and say like, Let's go and arrest those people. But the thing is, 
when people, see, because, uh, because we're just human, when we see a threat, we just act to, to it. We don't, we don't activate that human thing. So I don't know, uh, uh, how would we tackle kind of like this? Because we're not gonna stop doing AI. It's, it's doing yeah. a lot of good, but yeah. the human oversight is becoming less and less that people do not s oversee how, this, how this, this result came in. Do I have to look into it before I go and arrest yeah. people or judge them for mortgages or yeah, whatever you, it is? It's, it's a great question, right? Um, <laughs> I used to work in a credit lending department. If you have to leave, don't worry, you're welcome to get up and go, I know it's late. Um, but I used to work in a lending department and we introduced a new piece of software that allow us to make automatic decisions up to $10,000. Okay, that doesn't sound bad. Would you allow it to go up to a million dollars? Not sure. But there's a company in Finland and a company in Japan that have robots on their board of directors. So where do you set that sort of you know, threshold for robot intervention or AI intervention? It's a very interesting case, and I think what's happening is they're just continuously trying to refine what those guidelines are, what we can accept. There's one at the back. Hello, uh, my name is Folari again. Um, I love the presentation, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to first uh, give you a compliment because when you ask for the people that, that have arts background, I thought that was fantastic because uh, you included them in the AI uh, environment, and, and we do need those people who don't have limitations of math and science and rules based to actually be creative. And we all know that uh, you know, AI now uh, draws and, and uh, paints pictures, and yeah. it's actually something to behold. Um, but my actual question is something that uh, we can all relate to. It has to do with Tesla, right? Uh, Tesla is currently waiting for the government to allow self-driving cars to essentially self-drive on the roads. And uh, uh, the data uh, shows that their cars are now 10 times better uh, drivers than humans because they have 10 cameras all around. Yeah. You know, human beings only have two eyes. Uh, they have radars that scan the roads um, for, and they can even predict, uh, predict accidents two cars ahead before the accidents happen. So can you please give me your thoughts about how the government is, is, is you know, balancing the regulation yeah. of being careful you know, like not to give Tesla the permission to allow those self-driving cars to drive and actually um, you know, acting fast because those cars can actually save lives. Yeah. Can you give me your thoughts about the regulation on that? Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm sure lots of people have thoughts on autonomous vehicles. I have two thoughts. Um, one is around insurance. You know, so if you're driving one of these automated cars, who's at fault? Who's going, is it the manufacturer? Is it the driver? Is it, you know, um, uh, some of the insurance company? Um, interestingly enough, Tesla recently announced their own insurance company. If you're the car manufacturer, what a great idea, right? If they really believe they've done the numbers, then why not that? The other thing I think is a question around geofencing. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with geofencing, but just you know, give that sort of parameter where the vehicle can go. Um, and to my start small and scale, I firmly believe that rather than just simply launching autonomous cars onto the road, they started off in university campuses and Google campuses and so on. I really firmly believe that, it, that they will have the opportunity to start geofencing areas that the car could be in autonomous mode. Um, but it's going to create all sorts of interesting new dynamics. That's for sure. Are you in the business? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just make one more comment about your arts thing? Um, so, uh, for anybody who is in the arts, um, if, uh, artificial intelligence creates a sculpture or a painting, is it art? Some yeses, some noes. So a definite no? People will buy it. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Right? Ah, so there's a person behind the creation of the AI that's creating the art. It's very interesting. I always held the position that the artist is trying to tell a story when they're creating art of some kind. And an arts purist might do that. 
But when you mentioned, you know, the question around arts and artific you know, artificial intelligence, it goes way beyond. And I think whenever you're thinking about your solutions, think about the parameters that you're working within and the unexpected impacts. Do we have? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.